just want you to know who I, who I am and, and why I'm here. Um, my name is Lindsay LaPointe. I live in the 38th Ward. Um, I live right on the border of the 45th Ward, and I'm the Vice President of the 45th Ward Independent Democrats. I want to recognize um, my state rep and my committeeman, um, Rob Martwick, um, his wife Shannon, I'm uh, sorry, Sharon Martwick is here. Oh, Sharon, okay, good, thank um, you. Rob wanted to be here, but the, the young one was up all night, so he sends his regards. And I want to just recognize the work that he's done as my committeeman, especially over the last year when he came in. He has just convened so many events in his leadership team on his executive board and given us an opportunity a bigger opportunity in this neighborhood to participate in the Democratic Party and democracy. So I want to recognize Representative Martwick. Um, I myself, um, I'm a social worker, and then I moved into the policy realm, and now I'm more involved in community organizing and political organizing in this neighborhood in particular. And um, I started doing that around 2010, right when Tony came into office um, as the Cook County Board President. So I've been kind of watching you for a long time, especially around issues of criminal justice reform and equitable development. So the fact that I get to be the one asking you questions is a real treat. Um, well, thank you. And no better way to participate in this mayor's race than to have this intimate conversation and put your questions on an index card, for the most part, unedited. So <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of my own pass. Um, All right. And uh, there's some fun ones in there. So. Here we go. Um, this comes from someone who's lived in Chicago for her whole life. Mostly unedited again. Okay, so with Laquan McDonald, Ed Burke, and all the other issues impacting the city, I want to know why you want to be mayor at this moment in time and, and kind of why you feel optimistic about the future of the city of Chicago. Well, I'm, I'm optimistic, I, I should begin by saying, because I think we face really stiff challenges in the past and overcome them. And not to mention the fact that, you know, the city burned to the ground at one point and we rebuilt it. So we have a great tradition in the city of Chicago of addressing the challenges we face. You know, I, I was an alderman for 19 years. I was a local elected official. One of the things that I appreciated most about that was the opportunity to strengthen our neighborhood public schools. I'm a teacher by profession. I spent 10 years in the classroom. And I know that education is an escalator. We have to provide quality educational opportunities for our young people in all of our communities. And at the moment, we have an education system where you can pretty much determine the quality of the schools by the zip code that people live in, just as you can determine the life expectancy by their zip code. And sometimes those, dip, those life expectancies dip, differ by you know as much as 10 years and six miles separate the people involved. So there's a real challenge about opportunity and access to opportunity, and that focuses on our public schools. One of the things I enjoyed most was the opportunity to rebuild neighborhoods that were struggling. We built 1,500 units of housing in the fourth ward in my term as alderman, most of it affordable rental housing for working families. But we also did, we worked with CHA on CHA transformation, we did some market rate housing. So community building has always uh, been something that's been really important to me and, and very attractive about being alderman, about being mayor. And last but not least, um, you know, we have to address the violence in this city. Everybody has the right to feel safe in their home. We have 77 community areas, and 15 of them have 70% of the shootings. So we have to focus our energies on those communities and try to figure out. And, and the, the challenge they face are not just violence. They have low levels of educational attainment, high levels of unemployment, under-resourced schools or closed schools. So we have to, we have to have a holistic approach to those communities, and we have to do better on the policing side. More training for our officers, as the Department of Justice report um, indicated, better supervision. We also have, we have to have a more effective police force. We have <coughs> nationwide, about two-thirds of murders are closed. That is, they find somebody, they charge somebody. In the city of Chicago, it's less than 20%. So people in the communities that are most violent don't have any confidence that the police are going to solve the crimes. And, and that's right, because that hasn't been the case. We have to do better. Otherwise, you know, what happens is people lose faith in the, in the justice system, and then they take the law in their own hands. They think they, they should retaliate or seek revenge on their own, because they don't see that the criminal justice system is going to provide justice for them and their family. So we've got some real challenges, uh, but I look forward to the opportunity to address them with the help and support of the people of Chicago. 
you were alderman for many years and you've led one of the biggest counties in America. Um, for both roles, can you touch on one regret you have for both roles and what you consider your biggest success as alderman and then as county board president? Uh, early on in my tenure, there was a six flat building that was vacant uh, about a block, two blocks from my house. And every time I went out to walk my dogs, my neighbors were unhappy with me. And pointing out that there was this boarded up building, you know, two blocks away. A developer came in with a plan to uh, build townhouses there. I think it was six or seven. Um, I wasn't real happy with the design, but for several years I'd been challenged by my neighbors about why I wasn't doing something about this boarded up building. Um, and so we went ahead with the project. And in retrospect, I should have insisted on a higher quality development and fewer units. But I, I just got so tired of being um, called to account <laughs> by my neighbors uh, that I accepted uh, the, a development plan, which in retrospect, I, I would not have done it. And I sort of kicked myself about it afterwards and said, I have to have much higher standards for the development in my ward. And we, we, uh, we executed those higher standards in subsequent developments. Um, in this job, you know, the thing I thank you, the thing I, I really regret, we've had a lot of success in Springfield around juvenile justice. The first thing we did was work with advocates to raise the age at which you enter the, the, the adult system from 17 to 18. Now my view is that no teenager should be in the adult system, but um, it was better at 18 than 17. Because the, the juvenile justice system is focused on <coughs> rehabilitation and the adult system is focused on punishment. So that was the first success. The second success was reducing the number of crimes that would send a, a juvenile to adult court. It's called automatic transfer, AT. Um, and the third success was expungement. We were able to get legislation in Springfield that expunged the misdemeanor records and most of the felony records of juveniles. And we, we were in Illinois had one of the lowest rates of expungement in the nation. We had less than 3% of young people who were eligible for expungement who were getting their records expunged. So we were able to make some real progress around juvenile justice. So I'll tell you, we haven't been able to make much of any progress about adult justice, and that's it. Um, apparently, we're, we as a state are prepared to acknowledge that young people make mistakes, but not that adults make mistakes. That's a regret. Oh, things I'm proudest of. Um, <laughs> we did a lot of work in the fourth ward rebuilding communities that were struggling, and I'm very proud of that. Um, we had about 3,000 vacant city-owned lots in the ward. We did a lot of development. I think there are you know, maybe 300 left, so that we were able to put projects on 90% of them and, and dramatically uh, repopulate the ward, which I think is a, um, a big accomplishment. Where, on, I'm sorry, where is the fourth ward okay? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes roughly from, at least the time I served, it went roughly from the Museum of Science and Industry uh, down to Mercy Hospital. Um, it now goes into the loop uh, down to uh, uh, Jones High School. Um, it's it's uh, progressively pushed further north, uh, but it and basically King Drive to the lake. That's that's those were the boundaries when I was older. Um, one of my one of my proudest of, you know, well I guess the, the two things that I'm proudest of are the sustainability of our healthcare system because that's what I said I was going to work on when I got elected try to make sure our health care system was sustainable and that we were delivering good care to people. And then the criminal justice reforms, which have, um, as I said, dramatically reduced the number of people in the jail. We put a lot more emphasis on, on the diversion programs. Um, and now we're going to move toward pre-arrest diversion as opposed to diversion after the criminal justice system. Thank you. All right, we had several questions about pensions. Um, so I'm going to do some combining. Um, but it's, it's pretty simple. What's your plan to address Chicago's pension crisis? Um, and someone else is asking kind of what you've done at the county level for the county pension deficit. Um, well, let's start with the county. We had, we had real budget challenges in the first couple of years. We had a $487 million gap to close in our budget. Um, I said to the separately elected of whom there are 11, and this is going to be shared sacrifice, so there are 15% budget cuts uh, in each of the separately elected's office. We refinanced some of our debt. We, we did a lot of different things to try to meet the challenge. There was no sort of silver bullet, no single thing that we did that, that 
um, enabled us to close that budget gap. The next year, the budget gap was a little less. It was like 300 and, I don't know, 65 is what I remember, 68, something like that. After those first two really difficult years, I said to my staff, okay, we're, we're, we're managing the budget. What are the challenges that are down the road? And they said pensions. So we spent two years working with our unions. We got two-thirds of our unions to agree to a pension plan that we took to Springfield. Uh, but we could not get support in Springfield for that pension plan. Now, we didn't ask them for any money. All we asked them was to change the rules so that we could give more money, so that our employees could contribute more, so we could um, extend retirement ages out a little bit. Uh, but we couldn't get their help and support. And so finally what we did was, um, as you're aware, um, raise the sales tax by a penny to meet our pension obligations. And that has put us in, not only um, helped us meet our pension obligations, but put us in the best financial shape, the best fiscal shape of the city or the state. Now you could say that's a low bar, but we are in much better fiscal shape. We have investment grade bonds. Um, we're in much better fiscal shape than either of them. And it was because we made some difficult decisions. You know, my view is, and the Supreme Court has said, you know, you've pledged, you made a commitment to your employees, this is the commitment you have to honor. And if you don't address your pension crisis, you just pass it on to your children and your grandchildren. And I wasn't prepared to do that. It's like having a credit card and paying either the principal or the interest. Um, we're going to face some tough challenges in the city. There will be no single silver bullet, no magic solutions. We'll have to look at a variety of options. I've talked at the, the importance of um, looking at TIF reform. Tax interim finance and districts were supposed to be a tool to revitalize struggling neighborhoods, but almost all of the downtown is in one TIF or another. So our most valuable real estate is in one of these TIF districts. And there's been a big proposal for Lincoln Yards up here on the north side, uh, which would, over, over the, I think the life of it, withdraw $900 million out of the property tax base. You know, that's in an area where there's a, a lot of development pressure already, so it's hard to argue that, the, that this development won't take place without a, a tax income financing district. So um, I think that's one obvious way. We've talked about workman's comp, where the, the, the city's workman's comp expenses are, are clearly um, out of proportion. We have 22,000 county employees, a $20 million workman's comp bill. The city has 33, something like that, 1,000 employees, and a $100 million workman's comp bill. So some of the things you won't see until you actually get in there and you can figure out really what's going on. Uh, but those are some obvious examples of ways in which we can look for additional sources of revenue or make, make the city uh, more effective. We had a few questions about um, your plans to invest more in communities on the south and west sides of Chicago. Well, as I said, you know, we have a real problem with violence in our city. We have more murders than New York and Los Angeles combined, even though we're the third largest city in the country. I talked about some of the challenges that uh, those communities face. Another is, in the course of our, our work in the county, we've looked a lot at, at nationally which sort of city and regions are, are most um, economically vibrant. And it turns out that those that have the least inequality have the most growth. You know, I, I grew up in Minnesota, a senator named Paul Wellstone, and he always said, we all do better when we all do better. Um, and that, that, that's borne out uh, by the data about economic vitality. And uh, I think that we have, to, we have to address the challenges of our poorest communities, which are also, our, not surprisingly, our most violent communities, if we're going to have a real impact on not just the violence, but on the economic vitality of our, our city and our region. So, um, and I think money spent in supporting those communities, strengthening their schools, bringing uh, economic resources to those communities, pays off in the long run. Um, it's prevention and attention to young people and to education uh, pays off in productive adults. Uh, rather than adults involved in the criminal justice system. So I think those investments, the, the rationale for those investments can be made to the people of, of the city of Chicago, and um, those investments are really important for the long-term health, not just of those communities, but our entire city. Thank you. Uh, we had many questions about public education um, in an elected school board. So kind of broadly, I'll, I'll try to get it all in here. Um, what will you do differently for pub public education, um, specifically 
how to get more resources out of CPS central office and back into the classroom. And I'm sure you'll touch on an elected school board and, and someone's asking about the transition to an elected school board and, and training and support. Well, Lindsay is a, is a part of uh, uh, the organization that uh, Rob Martwick is leading, is that right? That's right, yeah. Uh, Rob Martwick is a supporter, I'm grateful. Um, he's the, the principal sponsor in the, in the legislature of the elected school board. I've pledged that I'll support an elected school board and work with him to try to make it work. Um, so that's the first thing. I've also called for a moratorium on school closings and more charter schools. Uh, you know, <coughs> charter schools were supposed to be a model that public schools could emulate, but they've turned into competitors and made it very difficult in some communities for the neighborhood public schools to survive and thrive. So that's a real challenge. Um, and, and frankly, um, a closed school is a very visible disinvestment in a community. Um, I think, what, three years ago they closed 50 schools. I think 38 of them are still vacant. So every day, you know, kids walk by that school on the way to the school that they now attend. And the community leaders, community members drive by, uh, and they see a, a vacant building, as I said, which is symbolic of the withdrawal of, of public investment in their neighborhood. So that's, I, I, as I said, I'm a favorite elected school board, a moratorium on new charters, moratorium on school closings. We have to strengthen our neighborhood schools. Okay, we're going to do a fun one. Um, what's your favorite museum in Chicago and why? So I'm a history teacher. It won't surprise you that my favorite museum is the... All right, that was quick. Um, what's your favorite deep dish pizza in Chicago? Ah, I need time to find the next good corporate. Giordano's. All right. Uh, <laughs> so we have one in our neighborhood. Awesome. <laughs> we have one right down the street. Okay, um, this is pretty specific, but I like it. Um, what sets you apart from other progressives in this race? Well, I, I've always said that I'm the most progressive. Um, first of all, I, I ran for Alderman in 1983 and I lost. Ran against the machine and I lost. I ran in 87 and I lost. I won, beat the machine uh, in 1991, 109 votes out of 11,000 cast. Um, as I said, when I was a city council, I was a, one of the founders, one of the three founders of the Progressive Caucus. Uh, I was the sponsor of every single affordable housing and living wage ordinance that came before the body. Again, one of five votes against the against the parking meter deal. You know, and as, as county board president, promoting that health care is a right, not a privilege, and that we need to invest in our health and hospital system, which is half of our budget, focusing on criminal justice reform, talking about the legalization of marijuana, talking about how you know our criminal justice system is at the intersection of racism and poverty, uh, that half the population of Cook County is African American and Latino, but 86% of the people in our jail are black and brown. Um, those are the kinds of things I've been saying for the last eight years, and which uh, in, in my capacity as county board president, and, and I think those are messages that need to be delivered, and they haven't been um, delivered with the same uh, intensity and commitment to change that I've been delivering for the last eight years. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a real specific question, but I'll zoom out, but I want to honor the question. So the question is, gentrification is a big issue in Pilsen. Um, so do you have any remarks about that? But I'll zoom out and just kind of ask about your thoughts on gentrification and displacement overall in the city of Chicago. Well, first of all, I've, I've said that I would support Representative Will Gazzardi's efforts to lift the ban on even talking about rent control. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, as I said, we built 1,500 units of housing when I was alderman. Most of that was affordable rental housing. Most of it was affordable rental housing. One of the ways in which you have to address gentrification is to build as much affordable housing as you can across the city. So even if, the, if there are macroeconomic changes, there's still a basis, um, a, a foundation of affordable housing for people who, for working families in the neighborhood. Um, and I think that it's, it's very tough to anticipate um, which communities are going to become hot, so to speak. Um, and, and one of the ways in which you can um, you can address the fact that it's not always easy to predict is to try to be sure that there's as much affordable housing everywhere as you possibly can. Um, so I, 
that would be a focus, trying to build and rehab as much affordable housing across the city as we possibly can. Great. I just want to shout out to my people at Neighbors for Affordable Housing on the Northwest Side. We've been fighting for a, a building in the 45th Ward, um, and I know that your agenda aligns with what we're doing, so I appreciate that. Um, so this is a this is a kind of a, a woman's event for Tony, so this question is appropriate. Um, it specifically asked sharing that more women need jobs um, in, in my community and in the city of Chicago. Um, and kind of we need your help um, as mayor on that subject. So can you just, just talk about kind of the status of women in Chicago and, and address this question? Well, one of the things that um, we did early on, uh, the city and the county combined their workforce initiatives. There was a mayor's office of workforce development and a, a city, uh, I'm sorry, a mayor's office of workforce development and a county office called the President's Office of Employment Training, Poet and Modi. And we combined the two of them because people work in the city and live in the county and vice versa. It didn't make sense to have two separate entities since you know, this is the county is, a, is an entity. Uh, so we put, put our, our Department of Labor money together, spun it off as a not for profit, which now um, can get philanthropic and corporate support as well as government support. It's called the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership. And I'm really pleased with the work that they've been doing, and we need to um, support that work with the leverage of the mayor's office, trying to ensure that, um, that the business community in Chicago knows how important it is that we support our, our workers. That's why I've, I've been in favor of the fight for 15. You know, $15 an hour will enable a family of four to be just above the poverty level. It's not an arbitrary number. It's the number that will take a family of four just above the poverty level. And so I've been uh, a strong proponent of the fight for 15 uh, since the very beginning and recently announced that we should proceed beyond July 1st of this year to raise the minimum wage 50 cents uh, an hour every six months until we're at $15 an hour. This question is about environmental justice. What's your plan to make Chicago a leader in environmental justice? One of the first things that Rahm Emanuel did was um, eliminate the Department of the Environment, which given the challenges we face globally, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So first we'll, we'll reinstate the Department of the Environment. The biggest environmental challenge I think we face is lead in our water. So we're going to have to do testing citywide. I mean, the, I think the federal requirement was 50 homes every three years. Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, we have to do citywide testing, mm -hmm. and then on the basis of what we learn from the testing, prioritize capital investments in replacing uh, water service lines to our homes and buildings. And this is, gonna, this is one of the biggest capital projects the city's ever going to undertake. But it's critically, there is no level of lead that's safe to have in our drinking mm -hmm. water. There is no level of lead. So, and, and the city mandated uh, led water service lines until 1986 when the federal government said, you know, look, this is, lead is dangerous. And then they, then they said, okay, you don't have to do that anymore. But, um, so we have, since, since the city obligated people to use lead water service lines long beyond the point when people realized that lead was dangerous, um, we should, as a city, test, figure out where our priorities are and get to work on replacing lead service lines. We have to do the assessment. There's no point in just starting randomly. Do the assessment and then prioritize the work and get going. And we're going to have to we're going to need federal, state, and local resources. Um, hopefully, this is something that, that we can get addressed in the capital bill. That one of the capital bills will be coming out of Springfield. Get some resources there. We're going to have to look for federal resources uh, related to the Environmental Protection Agency, um, and we're going to have to use our own local dollars. So it's a, it's a multi-level solution, but that would be the priority. This is a hyper vocal question. I also saw it on Facebook, so I want to get it in. Um, students at Carl Schur's High School um, are wondering if you're planning to attend their mayoral forum discussion this Monday. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have my calendar, so I can't tell you. <laughs> Some of your staff are done. Um, where's Chris Schaefer? Yeah. All right, Chris, check and see, would you? <laughs> Another fun one. Uh, do you support the Chicago Dibs winter parking system? <laughs> uh, it's a Chicago tradition. Okay. Um, what's the first thing that you would do if you can? You know, 
I, I think it's customary to give a speech when you're sworn in, and, and one of the things that I've got to talk about is equity. You know, we've got to have a, a city in which there's opportunity and equity. And, you know, there are lots of ways that the inequities are pretty damning. One is our public schools. One is our infrastructure investments. I was talking to somebody from Friends of the Parks the other day who was talking about investments in parks across the city. Uh, and that we've, we've kind of um, fallen back to the bad old days where the, the African American and uh, Latinx communities are clearly underinvested in. You know, there was a suit against the park district for a long time. Um, and the argument of this activist was, you know, we're sort of back to the terrible old days when it's quite clear that resources are not out allocated equ equitably. So I, the first thing I would do um, is talk about how the lens through which we need to look at, at, at activities in city government is an equity. Um, okay, I think this is a hard one for a lot of people to understand. I'm sure you have an amazing answer. Um, can you talk about reconciling the worlds of police accountability, really important right now, and criminal justice reform and how those things fit together? Well, I talked a little bit about police accountability. We need better training. You know, we, we haven't invested sufficiently in the training of our police officers. We've done them a real disservice. We need to invest more in, in crisis intervention training, de-escalation strategies. We need to figure out how we're going to address the terrible uh, issues of, of, of inability to close murder cases. And shoot. By the way, the closure rate for shootings is less than 10%. Mm. So the closure rate for murder is like 18%. Against, against a national <coughs> average of 62 or 63. So we've got some real challenge about training, around supervision. The, the national model is eight to 10 officers for every sergeant. We've got some districts in which sergeants have 30 officers to supervise. You know, when people are not well trained and not well supervised, they can't perform very well. Uh, and we have to do something about effectiveness. Now, if you're gonna have confidence in the criminal justice system, you have to have a well-trained, well-supervised, effective police force. But you also have to do a number of other things. Uh, in the county, we, we are responsible for the, the courts, as Commissioner Degnan can tell you, the courts and the jail. Um, but we weren't putting any money until I came into office into trying to flow the, st stop the flow of people into our criminal justice system. So we began investing in community-based organizations that do anti-violence, anti-recidivism, restorative justice work. And we spent about $18 million in the last five years on um, on those activities. And we started from nothing, so we kind of built up our, our capacity and our support. Uh, and the city has to invest a lot more in that as well. This is the first year that the city's had a, an office of violence reduction, or prevention, I think we call it, in the mayor's office. I would call it, you know, the mayor's office of criminal justice. Uh, but that office should focus on policy, it should focus on bringing the stakeholders together to try to address our public safety challenges, and it also should be the point of, of grant administration. And although there's some money for grants in the present office, it's basically consolidating grants that were listed in the budget elsewhere. <coughs> what we need is more money. Um, we pay a terrible price as a city for the violence. And it's not just the, the tragic deaths and the ripple effects in the communities that are most violent. It impacts all of us. You know, <coughs> I don't know about you, but I, I talk to my family members sometimes out of town on Sunday, and if we've had a bad weekend, a number of murders, that's the first thing they ask. Mm -hmm. What's going on in Chicago? You know? mm -hmm. um, and if you're thinking about moving someplace, either you yourself or you're thinking about moving your business, um, the level of violence in some of our communities that is perceived to be everywhere in the city is a real detriment to mm -hmm. us economically. So we have, to, we have to address it for the social justice reasons first, but it also has an economic impact addressing it. Okay, we have some pretty specific questions. How do you feel about parking tickets disproportionately affecting the poor? Yeah. Um, we, we put out a, a policy statement this week. Uh, you know, if you look at the 10 communities that are most impacted by, by parking tickets, I think eight of them are African Americans. African American communities, um, and disproportionately, these are the poor Black and Brown communities in the city that are so impacted by 
parking tickets. And if you go to traffic court, you would think that only black and brown people live in the city. Mm -hmm. Another very specific question. Will the grid system at Streets and Sand be revised? Mm. Um, when I was alderman, one of the um, one of the most effective parts of our uh, operation was our ward office and our ward superintendent. And the, you know what you could do if you were alderman uh, was call your ward soup and say, "This is what I need done," and it would get done. Um, and I used to go out with the ward soup, <laughs> especially when we were clear, clearing snow. Um, and the situation now doesn't give um, aldermen the opportunity to have the kind of direct, um, the ability to direct services. Uh, so that's a challenge. I'll have to look at it. I, I will just tell you that I continue to get complaints that not all parts of our city um, are treated equally when it comes even to snow removal. That some parts of the city get cleaned quickly and, and, and thoroughly, and other parts are clearly at the end of the priority list. And you won't be surprised with which communities those are. So, so this is a really specific question about um, the connection between animal, excuse me, animal abuse and domestic violence. Mm -hmm. um, so you can ad address that if you want, kind of what are your thoughts on that intersection of animal abuse and domestic violence, but I would ask you to kind of talk more broadly about kind of the state of domestic violence. Well, I think that um, people who are unwell and abusive are likely to abuse um, the creatures in their home as well as the people in their home, so um, that's a real challenge. You know, I think that I've talked about a little bit in, in relation to the police, that we need better preparation for our police in crisis intervention, and that's often domestic violence situations that police are brought into, um, and de-escalation strategies. You know, I think we need to um, provide more mental health services. You know, the city closed seven of its 12 mental health clinics. And the argument was made that this was to save money. But I will tell you that it doesn't save money. It just shifts costs. So, you know, if you close mental health clinics and people don't have access to treatment and meds, we find that, that more people show up in our emergency room at Stroger Hospital in crisis because they haven't, got, haven't gotten access to their meds or their treatment. Or they end up acting out in ways that put them in the criminal justice system. So it doesn't save costs. It just shifts costs from the city to the county, to our public health system, to our public safety system. Um, so we need to invest more in behavioral health services, and the county, frankly, did not was not doing very well in that score uh, until Dr. Raju, who um, came on board, I think, a year or two after I was elected as head of our health and hospital system, and who 